I think you'll have a lot of uh, great procedural cases, uh, but the one I'm actually going to present about is more of a diagnostic dilemma that we had and how we approach and treat. Um, and this was basically a 54-year-old gentleman who had um, presented with uh, his right uh, index finger with bluish discoloration. So, you know, very interesting case, 54-year-old, really no significant past medical history except for a little bit of diabetes, prediabetes, and hypertension, had three-week history of uh, right distal aspect of his index finger being blue, having bluish discoloration. Um, so, you know, on physical examination, his physical examination was fairly unremarkable, um, except for the fact that the right hand, when you examined it, you could see the bluish discoloration in about the distal half, two-thirds of his finger, um, and also he had a one-plus radial pulse. Uh, you know, he saw his uh, nurse practitioner first, who, was referred to a, who referred him to a rheumatologist who had put him on anticoagulation. Um, actually did proceed with doing some vascular studies, uh, did receive a wrist brachial index, which you can see over here, was fairly normal. Um, and uh, so here the wrist brachial index was normal in this particular patient, but if you look at the digital waveforms, the right second digit, the, uh, the waveforms were fairly flattened and actually was a little bit of a lower amplitude even in the first digit. Um, as you would expect, the rheumatologist sort of proceeded with doing a bunch of hypercoagulable tests, rheumatological workup, all of it came back negative with mildly elevated homocysteine levels. He did undergo an echocardiogram that showed there was no evidence of any vegetation or thrombi noted. And the imaging quality was very good. So, he also did get a CTHS before he ended up seeing us. And, and the CTHS, they again did not see any significant atherosclerotic plaque. Um, the vessel walls did not appear thickened as you would see in any kind of arthritis like giant cell arthritis or any form of vasculitis. So at this time, he was referred to us for further evaluation. And so, so when we see the blue finger, what are your typical differential diagnosis? Some of these have been excluded. As we know, cardiac etiology, vasculitis have been excluded, but what else would you think about it? And so when I look at these cases, you know, you have a gamut of things that you could still consider in somebody who's not a smoker, and sort of these kind of go through our list in our minds. Um, and so, you know, we started sort of slowly excluding what potentially could be the etiology. We didn't think this was arthritis based on the CTA. Um, it wasn't collagen vascular disease. We didn't think he had any physical findings that would make you concerning for, you know, Adler's Danlos or Louis Thiet syndrome, anything like that. Um, certainly was not, no evidence of uh, cholesterol embolism, um, no aneurysmal disease that we could initially note. Um, no evidence of cold injury or any kind of hematological disorder as was noted initially. So it kind of came down to these potential four differential diagnoses for us. Could be thoracic outlet syndrome, FMD, thrombosis, or hypothenar hammer syndrome. Um, and it's important to have this idea before you proceed with an angiogram because you know, the way you do it would actually be a little different. So starting on with the first, you know, we proceeded with an angiogram. As you can see here, the subclavian actually looked quite clean. Um, and the axillary artery on initial study, um, and this was in adducted position. So to rule out potentially thoracic outlet syndrome, we proceeded with doing an angiogram on an abducted, um, adducted position, and you actually can see this mild compression over there of the subclavian at the thoracic outlet segment. Um, so here in an adducted position, you see there is no uh, narrowing noted. In abducted, there is some narrowing. Again, it's not very significant, but there is a mild narrowing that we do see. So, so again, this patient could potentially have thoracic outlet syndrome as a potential etiology for this presentation. Proceeded further with the angiogram, and you can notice here, as you see this sort of little bit of irregularity in the brachial artery, more in the mid and the distal aspect of the brachial artery. Um, looking at it more closely, you can notice this over there, just magnifying it and you see this irregular beaded-like appearance over the brachial artery. Um, and this is something that we, you know, as fibromuscular dysplasia, or very likely for fibromuscular dysplasia. Um, so this was another potential differential diagnosis for us. Um, and then proceeding further on, we did notice that um, uh, uh, distally, his ulnar artery had this coxrew-like collateral appearance, and the radial artery also was occluded. And this is what would, would make us consider if this could be hypothenar hammer syndrome. So we started going through potential differential diagnosis for him for these three. 
you know, we kind of went through this, first thought about could it, this be hypothenar? So we actually did the angiogram of the contralateral side. Didn't, we saw the same similar findings on the contralateral side, made us think this could be some kind of congenital anomaly. Plus, he didn't have any history that fit with vibratory tool use or things like that, which often is associated with hypothenar hammer. So we didn't think this was the potential etiology. Thoracic outlet was possible, but the compression was mild, and he did not have any post-stenotic subclavian aneurysm formation, which is typically what we see with th thrombosis. So it didn't seem like that was um, the e potential etiology. So we felt that this was put in, this is most likely brachial artery uh, fibromuscular dysplasia. CTA actually did show that he had right external iliac artery FMD as well and a left renal artery aneurysm. Um, thrombolysis, catheter-direct thrombolysis didn't work for him, unfortunately, because the clot was three weeks old. By the time this was done, he actually had surgical resection of the thrombus and a graft placed and did pretty well after that. So, you know, just briefly about FMD. We think FMD in the brachial arteries is fairly rare, but I think this might be more underrepresented because we don't actually image them. Um, at my center, I have a pretty large number of patients with FMD. So we did scan in the last year, 66 patients had duplex scans for FMD, and we found that up to 26% of them had brachial FMD. And interestingly, there was a very strong correlation of presence of external iliac when they had brachial FMD as well. Um, so this is just a management approach, but a lot of these patients are asymptomatic, and typically we just use antiplatelet for them. If they are mildly symptomatic or moderately symptomatic, um, angioplasty is typically enough. Um, distal thromboembolism may require catheter-directed lysis or further surgical procedures for symptom relief. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very interesting case. I always say that when you're dealing with the hand and the finger, it's really a much more significant issue, particularly, you know, when patients have acute ischemic uh, changes to the fingers and, and, and how to treat them. Uh, I, I thought the differential was interesting, was uh, very, you know, the way you went through it, I thought it was very interesting and good. Uh, I, again, I always, to me, I think I treat a blue finger a lot more, you know, it's, it's a bigger, it's more of an emergent issue than maybe a blue toe. I don't know why, but I mean, I think a hand and a finger is so much more important to a, per, to a patient. So having a, a good idea how you're going to evaluate them and really be aggressive and quickly. You know, I mean, this is something that I probably, hopefully a patient was admitted and was getting this work up, you know. Again, and I, I've learned that I, I, go, I go to angiography early, so. All right, excellent case. Just one uh, quick question. What, what is uh, follow-up for these uh, patients, especially the brachial FMD? The brachial Do you guys FMD. have any experience with that? So, you know, it's controversial, really. We don't have any data on it. Um, really, uh, you know, we did a um, sort of, there, there were just case reports of it. Just about last year, we actually combined the, our data with Cleveland Clinic, published some data, outcomes data, and really came up with that chart that I had shown at the end. And a lot of this is expert opinion, but often, you know, if, um, if they are mildly symptomatic, we just leave them on antiplatelet therapy, and that's just to avoid thromboembolic events. There's no real, you know, a lot of, this is just sort of thinking that if there's turbulence, there could be microthrombi, and they may end up with, uh, with a clot distally or so on. Um, so, so that's sort of what we, you know, do with that. Now, if they are fairly, if this gentleman had already been on an antiplatelet agent and then had a thromboembolic event, we would have potentially proceeded with angioplasting the brachial artery. But in this case, uh, we decided not to and just placed him on antiplatelet after the, the procedure was done. A really nice case, Aditya, and I, th I really like um, how you work through the differential. It makes a lot of sense. And it is something that probably requires angiography. Uh, when you see brachial FMD, do you treat that the same as if you see it in the renals or carotids as far as screening for aneurysms? Yes, yes, yeah, definitely. So, you know, what's interesting is I, I, we don't really look for brachial FMD as we look for renal or carotids when patients present to us. I, I, in the sake of time, I actually didn't show the fact that he had a CTA done and that did not show brachial FMD. So we still proceeded with the angiogram, and that's where we saw all these findings. And interestingly, we, when we did for, proceed with angiogram, we were really looking more for the hypothenar hammer uh, and the TOS evaluation. However, you know, this just came by incidentally. Um, and so, so I, 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 you know, so anecdotally, I think when we look through these, if you have hemodynamic stenosis, sometimes a duplex might be better if done properly um, than a CTA in these scenarios. Sure. So, yeah, Great. it's, it's Great. kind well, of interesting. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thanks.